Herzlich Willkommen. Has anyone read the book Unorthodox from Deborah Feldman? Oh, quite a few, okay. Um, so my story is a bit similar to that, but from the man's point of view, which if you know something about the Haredi world is very, very, very different. So the title of this lecture is From B'nai Brak to Berlin, and this is what we're going to discuss here, a brief overview of my life, the Satmar community as an example of a Hasidic community, and what life within the community looks like. First, something short about me. I grew up in Muncie, New York. At the age of 18, I left for Israel to study. Um, in many articles, they wrote that I left to continue my rabbinical studies, even though I was already an ordained rabbi by the age of 17. But I did continue my studies in Israel for about another 10 years. And at the age of 29, I left uh, B'nai Brak to study Jewish studies in Berlin. And about six months ago, I became the rabbi of Mikvan, lovely community in Basel. We have here a few members from Mikvan. <laughs> and uh, the rabbi of the city of Dresden. recently filmed. Um, I just wanted to ask you, what, what do you see here? What, what's happening in this clip? What is he doing? What's going on here? What? He's a famous singer? Okay. He does it like a professional. Yes, he does that. He's leading the community. Could be for him? <laughs> well, we all agree it's a very cute clip, and we're going to come back to this in the end. First, a brief history on the Hasidut Satma. This is a, a slideshow that was put together by a very dear friend of mine, Dr. Herbert Lapper from Dresden. He actually traveled to the city of Satomara in Romania nowadays and he took a few pictures there. He, he gave the title Aus dem Ghetto in die Welt, which is probably quite accurate for the transmission from the ultra-Orthodox world into the uh, liberal or general world. <laughs> and I have to specify, see, we have a few, we spoke to a few ultra-Orthodox people living here in Zurich. In Zurich. Um, it's a very different world from what we expect and what we see here of just observant um, black kippah, white shirt people living in Zurich. The ultra-Orthodox living in the States and in Israel would not accept them as Chavidim, as ultra-Orthodox, as part of their own. But just a short, just a short overview of the Satmer Hasidut. Satmer comes from the city Satomara, St. Mary, that was in, then it was in Hung Hungary, it's on the border so it keeps moving back and forth, nowadays it's in Romania, and it was at the time that the Grand Rabbi Joel Teitelman was there, it was part of Hungary. And this is just a short 
summary of the Jewish communities that were there in the region at the time. So, one of the greatest changing points in Jewish history is Gzerot Tachtat, the 1648-1649 massacres by Bogdan Chelmanitsky. It's unclear how many Jews were killed through that time. It's estimated somewhere between 30 and 100,000 Jews. Many communities were destroyed. Many Jews were burned alive in the, in the synagogues while Bogdan Chelmanitsky was traveling through his, his route. And according to many historians, that is a changing point that led into everything we know nowadays of Jewish history. Zionism, liberal Judaism, Kabbalah, Hasidut. That was a time when the Jewish people saw this is very, very bad. Because we have approximately a thousand years from the Babylonian times until this uh, Tachtat massacre that nothing really substantial happens in the Jewish nation. And from this point, we have after the Talmud. Yeah, but what but it didn't make very big changes on a global scale oh, okay, yeah. in the Jewish nation. And from this point, we have Shabtai Tzvi coming down, and then, then we have Shabtai Tzvi, does the name say? Everyone knows who Shabtai Tzvi is? The, the famous no. Messiah? No. No. And from that, we have the Zionist movement, the Hasidic movement, the, the, the Haskalah, which then afterwards turns into the liberal Jewish movement. This is just a, a short overview of how we came to it. This is a picture of the city of Satomara, of Satma, before the Second World War. This is just a marketplace. This is what it looks like in October 2019. This picture was taken by Helbert Lappe when he traveled there recently. This is the famous synagogue that was renovated recently. This is the synagogue where Rabbi Joel Teitelbaum was the rabbi. This is the inside of the synagogue. And after the war, Satmar moved to first to Israel and then to the United States of America, where he established nowadays the largest Hasidic group in the world, which has approximately 25,000 families. The second largest Hasidic group is the Gul Hasidut. I don't know if you noticed. Um, the guy in the kitchen, the Mashgir Kashut, the one who's overseeing the kosher food here, he belongs to the Gul sect. There are approximately 15,000 families, and they're based in Israel mainly. And the Satma group is ba mainly based in the United States, in New York, in upstate New York, and in Brooklyn. And of course, they have branches in England, in Antwerp, in Israel, in Bnei Brak, in Yerushalayim, and maybe, here, maybe some other places I forgot about. So, I'd like to go back now to the life in the community, what it looks like. What is this picture? Is that Pidyon Ben? Pidyon Ben. Pidyon Ben is something that's usually not practiced in liberal communities, but is, is still very much practiced within the Ishe Kler Gleich. It's still very much practiced within the ultra-Orthodox and Orthodox community. How can you see this as the Pidyon Aben? The jewelry. The jewelry. So the, the, the process of the Pidyon Aben is that every, this is a, a, a biblical verse, that every firstborn should be bought back from the priest. The reason of that being because the fir firstborn should have belonged to the temple and the ceremony that happens in such, a, in such an occasion is that the priest holds the baby, the Kohen, from, from the, from the uh, Levi tribe. He holds the baby and asks the father, what would you prefer, your child or the five silver coins you have to give me to buy your child from me? And the father, there's a text that he says in Aramaic, he says, I, want my, I prefer my child, he gives him five coins and then um, gets back his child, even though priest doesn't really have right to take the child if he doesn't pay for it back. It's just a very symbolic gesture that's done. 
Um, I personally went through this myself because I'm the oldest, I'm the oldest of my family. So the fir all the firstborns in Orthodox world and especially in orth ultra Orthodox world go through this. And it's done in a very glamorous way. The child is put into a silver basket. All the women put their gold jewelry on the child. And around the child, they put pieces of garlic and uh, sugar, sugar cubes. <laughs> and that is afterwards given out to the people to take home to eat. And they believe it has mystical powers. The pieces of food that was in this basket. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> the next stage in a child's life is Chalaka. Cheder. The Chalaka Upsheren in Yiddish, Chalaka in Hebrew or Arabic originally, is the first haircut. Haredi, ultra Orthodox boys, do not get any haircut before the age of three, no matter how long their hair grows. At the age of three, we get our first haircut. Many keep the hair, weigh it, and then give the value of that weight in gold to charity. That is a custom. But on the day of the chalaka, on the day that somebody turns, a boy turns three, he is wrapped in a talit, so he shouldn't see anything impure outside on the street. He's taken to the Rebbe, to the school, where he is taught for the first time the Aleph bit. And then as part of the ceremony, he licks off honey of three letters, Aleph, Mem, and Taf, Emet, truthfulness, truth. And that's also the first letter, the last letter, and one in the middle. And it's a ceremony that's supposed to give the child a sense that studying Torah is very sweet. We learned the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet, before we learned the ABCs, although we grew up in the United States. The whole school system is independent and is not bound, almost not bound, to any of the laws how schools have to be run. But something else also happens from the age of five, because by the age of three, we're still in some kindergarten. My mother, for instance, she had a kindergarten for many years. And in the kindergarten, in the, in the years from two to five, boys and girls were studying together. Once we hit the age of five, boys and girls study separately. From the age of five, the only contact we have, technically speaking, with other girls is our sisters, grand grandmothers, aunts, and also that is only until a certain age. This is a this is what um, this is a picture from Yerushalayim. The boys are being taken. <laughs> but the, the reason why they're holding each other is just not to fall out of line. But for me personally, this picture symbolizes something very much that's within the system, where everything has to go a very certain way. I remember the first time I saw the song, uh, I saw the clip, Another Brick in the Wall from Pink Floyd. I, it, for me, it seemed like this is a they're talking about our education system. This is exactly the, the, the company we're going through. And the options that we have, the outcome of our education, is only one option. This is a screenshot of Shikun Vizhnitz in B'nai Brak. The way the community is built up is that everything that one needs in their life can be done or has to be done within the community. When I was in yeshiva studying in Bnei Brak, 
when I was about 18, one of my rabbis said that he knows people that never left the shikun. The shikun is a bitzilk, it's like an area within B'nai Brak. It's when you come in, and, and if any of you have been in B'nai Brak, it's when you come into B'nai Brak on the left side, when you go down the bridge next to Coca-Cola. Uh -huh. <laughs> and this shikun, this part of B'nai Brak was built by Rabbi Chaim Meir Hagel from Vizhnitz, the, previ uh, the previous, previous uh, grand rabbi from Vizhnitz. He was born in Europe and came to Israel after the war. The way the rabbi in my yeshiva explained it to me is that within the shikun, which in this area, the moment a boy is put onto the bus at the age of five to go to the first grade, that's where the number one is, his whole life stays within the shikun. Number one is the, is, the, is the elementary school. Number two is the yeshiva. Number three is the kolel, where they study after the wedding. Number four is the synagogue. Number five is the old age home. And number six is the cemetery. <laughs> yes, there are many synagogues, but this, this synagogue at number four, this is the main synagogue of the Vizhnitz sect. So the biggest trip is actually from the old age home to the cemetery. The cemetery. Because the cemetery is supposed to be outside of the city, traditionally. When this area was built, this was in the outskirts of the city. Nowadays, because everything grew so much and they built so much houses, so it's, it's technically in the city still. But traditionally speaking, the cemetery is also always outside of the city. What does a school day look like for somebody studying in an ultra-Orthodox school from the age of 5 until the age of 13. We had one, day, one hour a day of secular studies. In this hour, we had to learn a bit of English, a bit of math, some history, and that was all the time we had. All the other hours of the day, was only for religious studies. So we would start off at a very young age studying with the Torah, then growing older, Rashi, after that, Mishnah and Talmud, all the way through until the age of 13 in the Bar, Mit the Bar Mitzvah. In these school hours, we had no sports, of course, no computers, computers we should not even have at home at all in the first place. And you, you know the story with the chimney? This was explained to us when we were very young. How the thought process of studying the Talmud works. So all these stories always, always have a Jew and a non-Jew. The non-Jew asks the Jew, can you teach me some Talmud? He said, of course. Let me tell you something from the Talmud. Two people go, through, go down a chimney. Which one bathes themselves? I see some of you know. Yes. So he says, well, of course. The one, who's, the one who's dirty bathes himself, and the one who's not dirty doesn't bathe himself. And he says, no. You're missing the Talmud logic here. What happens is like this. The one who's dirty looks at the one who's not dirty and thinks he's not dirty. The one who's clean looks at the dirty person and he says he's dirty, so he has to go bathe himself. I says, okay, I get, I get it now. Teach me Talmud. He says, fine, let me ask you a question. Two people go down the chimney. One is dirty, one isn't. Which one bathes himself? He says, oh, I know that one. The one who's clean looks at the other one and he bathes himself. He goes, no. The one who's dirty looks in the mirror, sees he's dirty. <laughs> And he has to go bathe himself. The one who's clean sees he's clean. He doesn't bathe himself. He says, yeah, but you didn't tell me there's a mirror there. Says, That's the logic of the Talmud. You have to think of all the options. So he goes, okay, now tell, teach me Talmud. It's good. Two people go down the chimney. One gets dirty, one doesn't. Who bathes himself? So he says, well, if there's no mirror, then the clean person bathes himself. If there's a mirror, then whoever's dirty bathes himself. And he says, no. 
How could two people go down the same chimney, one get dirty and one not? <laughs> when we study from the beginning, the goal is never to learn something from it. The ultimate goal from studying is the studying itself. That's all we're there for. We should try to understand the text. We should try to be busy with the text because the people we look up to, they're the people that only study text all day. The ultra-Orthodox world is probably the most sex-segregated community nowadays existing. There is no contact between men and women from a very young age. I think from probably about the age of nine, I never touched my, any of my aunts. My sisters I probably stopped touching when I was 13. Not even a handshake or anything. The only ones you're still allowed to hug is your mother and your grandmother. There is no public affection between husband and wife or any physical affection ever. And it's built that we live in two separate worlds. We have our duties, they have their duties. We have to do ours, they have to do theirs. So yeshiva boys, for instance, they won't clean up ever because they should be studying. The girls in the house, they should be cleaning up because that's their job as women and that's what they're going to have to do their whole life anyway. So it's good for them to start practicing when they're young. The kitchen is off limits for the boys, generally speaking. If they have an extra moment, they should be studying to walk. This, for instance, is a picture from Israel. In Israel, they have something that's called Chof Mahadrim. It's a Mahadrim beach, like a kosher beach, where it's isolated from all the other beaches around it. There's a separate entrance that goes all the way up to the street with walls on both sides. And this part of the beach will be for men or women separately. In other, in the, different days, so they never even meet in the same place. In America, we didn't have that. We only had swimming pools in the summer. and the swimming pools, we had boys' days and girls' days. But the community is isolated from every concept that exists in Western society. So if you think of anything you know, Shakespeare, Freud, um, Einstein, just any general concept uh, of uh, the Beatles, just anything you know, people growing up in the ultra-Orthodox world have no idea of the existence of such things. There's no radio, there's no television, all the newspapers are only internally in, in, in America, it would be either in English or in our community it would be in Yiddish. In Israel, it's in Hebrew. They have their own radio system where you call up to hear the news on the phone and somebody records it. That was one of my jobs also in Israel, recording the news. And the news that, that is given to the people is, not, is usually not the general news, it's news within the community. Um, the, these newspapers will never report about rape, Jeff, generally not about murder, no suicide, these things don't exist at all. And if they report about general news from the world, they will always look for the angle that is relevant for the community, where they can say something, yeah, this and this happened because of, or how does this affect us? And the wording is very, very um, chosen down to, the, down to the smallest part of the, of the text, that it's always kept clean, 
and children don't get any ideas that they're not supposed to get, for instance, anything sexual. Because in, our, in the community, we don't talk about sex until we get married. Now, the newspapers had a very big problem. When Hillary was running for president in the United States, they somehow had to report it. This was a bit earlier. We all know, we all know this picture. This is the Situation Room when Bin Laden was killed. These newspapers, they don't put pictures of women in them. So what do you do with a picture like this? This is an iconic picture. We need it. It's part of the news. This is what it looked like in our newspapers. Hillary and the woman standing behind, I forgot her name, were both photoshopped out. Interestingly, after Hillary's emails were hacked, we got a glimpse that she knew about this, and it bothered, bothered her very much that she was photoshopped out. But the fact that it reached her, this is an internal ultra-Orthodox newspaper with very few people reading it in terms of the American population. This reached her, and she wrote very angry emails about this picture. When she was running for president, the newspapers wanted to report about her. This is a picture of Clinton. Clinton addressing a rally in St. Petersburg, Florida. Towards the end of the Democratic race, they really felt like they have to put in something into the newspaper. And this is the most woman picture that this newspaper gave out. The details within the community goes down to the smallest details. <laughs> there is only one dress code that is permitted for boys. Black and white, and within that, the shirt has to be a Hasidic shirt, which is from right to left, which we all know is women's shirts. But the Hasidim wear from right to left. The glasses have to be very specific plastic glasses. Anything other than that is called modern, too modern that you might be expelled from the school for that. The shoes have to be bought in a very specific part of a very specific kind of store. It has to be plain, it has to be simple, no colors whatsoever. Walking out on the street, always you have to wear your hat and jacket, no matter if you live in Israel and how hot the weather there is, and no matter if it's in the nine days from the beginning of the month of Av until Tisha B'Av, where you don't shower, halakhically, they don't shower they still would wear their hat and jacket. If you step out of your house without your hat and jacket, you might be expelled from school for that, even though it's outside of school hours. There is, however, small differences within the ultra-Orthodox world where you can see differences in clothing. <laughs> this is a project that a dear friend of mine in Israel made, Malki Fogel. She is an ex-ultra-Orthodox Hasidic woman. And she tried to show the differences between different Hasidic sects. Every Hasidic child will notice right away what the differences are and be able to point out who belongs to what by these small changes. Can you try to point out differences? Huh? Longer and shorter. Gray and black. The hats are different. 
That's a completely different. Trousers mm -hmm. in or out? Trousers in or out? The coat. The pay is? The coat? The button is closed. Yes, that would indicate how, how formed someone is. If he's a bit modern, he might open his top button. Mm -hmm. That's the room that they have to play around with. The one on the right, the first one, is supposed to show the most modern Hasidic man. With his hand in his pocket and a smartphone in his hand. The one after him is Gul. They would have a roundy hat and their, their socks would be in their pants only half ways. So you could see the pants on the bottom. See that point there? That's where it stops. In contrast to the next one, where it goes all the way up, the next one is Toldota Haon, there in Mea Shaarim. One after that is Breslev. The one after that is Brisk and then Bells. She just chose a few things where you can see the differences, but the one on the right, for instance, could be met, belong to many different groups. So, the yeshiva world works from the age of 13 until the age of marriage. We study from 7 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night, only Torah. The only breaks that we have are around Sukkot and around Pesach, semester ferien between the two semesters. We have a winter semester and a summer semester, Zman Kaid, Zman Choref. Within the semesters, we have more intense learning times. For instance, now we are in the weeks that are called Shovevim. Shovevim is the time from the, we have, the Torah is divided into portions. Every week we read one portion. Portions have names. We are now in the second book that starts with Shmot, Ve'era, Bo Bishalach. So the first letter of the first six parshiot is Shovevim. It stands for Shovevim. And this connects to a verse in Hosea where the prophet says, Shuvu banim Shovevim, naughty boys return to God. So in the Hasidic Yeshiva, these <coughs> six weeks were very intense study. At times, we would study 18 hours a day without speaking anything else other than Torah in between. From the moment you wake up to the moment we go to sleep. Another way that the people are controlled within the community, or the boys in the yeshiva are controlled, is by psychiatric pills. This is a scandal that has been brought up many times in the media in Israel. I personally was sent to a psychiatrist in Manhattan when I was approximately about 17 years old. My yeshiva forced my parents to take me to a psychiatrist in Manhattan to give me something to calm me down. And he gave me a prescription based on, not based on talking to me, based on what the school said they demanded. When my parents paid the $1,200, whatever this costed, and wanted to pick up the prescription, I told them not to bother because I will never take these pills. And, but I do know many of my friends that did get pills. Um, in many cases, against sexuality. One of the things, the main reason why the sexes are so apart is to prevent young boys from having impure thoughts, or thoughts about women, or masturbating. When they find out that somebody in the yeshiva is masturbating, they could decide to give them pills so they cannot get an erection. And in some cases, it will harm them in the future for having kids. This was in the news many times, you can Google it in Israel, and it's still going on. I personally saw a draw full of pills that the rabbis had in their office that they could just give out to whoever they want if they decide that they need it, not based on any professional evaluation.
marriage. Any of you see the series Stissel? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. If you... yeah. <laughs> it is quite accurate what it really looks like. Um, I must say that because I was their religious advisor. <laughs> so. <laughs> it's actually quite accurate. So, married, if, me, if boys and girls don't have any connection, how do they meet? Shiduch, matchmaking. There is a profession within the community which is called a shadchan. This person usually gets a thousand dollars from each side, from the boy's side and from the girl's side, to put the match together. They will meet in a neutral house usually, either in the Shatchan's house or in some family member's house. The amount of times they will meet before they get engaged varies from one to three, usually. Three would be a lot. These meetings are very short, about an hour, up to two hours, just basic. Seeing each other, they're both very young. My mother had me when she was 18. And she got married when she was 17. I got married when I was, I got engaged when I was 19, got married when I was 20. The girl would usually be at least one year younger, so 17, 18, 19. Within the rabbinic dynasties or within more extreme Haredi groups, they can get married as young as 13 and 14. It is, of course, in Israel it's not legal, they will hide the marriage and do it secretly and only do the official paperwork when they're 18, or in the United States, they would travel to a different state where it's legal. In the United States, underage marriage is still legal in many states. At this point, the only knowledge the boy has is Torah knowledge. He has no profession, never studied anything, doesn't have any proof that he studied in the yeshiva whatsoever, because we never have tests. We all have, if we have something, it's an oral test. So, no document, no diploma. And the woman might, at this point, know how to do something very simple. Sometimes they would do some computer course where she could work as a secretary, or she could find jo a, a job within the community that does not require any official knowledge. Within the community, Many jobs are done. For instance, I worked as a journalist before I ever studied anything. You know, we, we live in the Western world, we know a journalist at least has a BA or MA in something in order to be able to be accepted. But within the community, if you know how to do it, you can do it. No, no one cares what we studied because nobody studied anything anyway. So, between the engagement and the marriage, it could be a few months up to a year. A very good friend of mine told me that he was standing under the chuppah and he thought to himself, the last time he saw his bride was a year ago. He saw her once. They could have just put someone else there and he would never know. Mm. So the families will prepare everything for the couple. In Israel, within the Haredi communities, they would, in many cases, buy them an apartment. In America, they would rent them one. Everything will be prepared for the couple, all the furniture. The bride might help choosing it. The group is not supposed to be part of that process whatsoever. He's supposed to be studying at this time Torah. After the marriage, he is supposed to continue to study Torah in the higher yeshiva, which is called Kolel. Kolel is a place where married men go to study Torah. They usually will get some money from the Kolel. In Israel, they will get benefits from the government as well. And at this point, the woman will have to go work to support the house. Men could stay in Kolel anywhere between one year and 50 years. My father, for instance, stayed in the Kolel for 25 years. He did try to have some small jobs, like teaching kids privately, 
and making money from that, but other than that. And in America, because the whole system works off the books, they all could get social benefits from the government. They could get housing, they could get money for the kids, because everything's off the books. They could declare not having any money. If they would hang up a, a sign in the, in the community that they're looking for someone to work, they would have to specify, is it going to be on the books or not? Do you just want to write your paycheck on my name, or do you really want me to work? One of the poorest cities on paper in the United States is Kiryat Yoel. Kiryat Yoel is in the state of New York. It's about an hour and a half north of the city of New York. If you ever drive into the city of Kiryat Yoel, it's where the Satmar people live, you will see huge houses with fancy jeeps parked in every driveway. And they are, on paper, one of the poorest cities in the United States. Because they have a whole system, a financial system, that works outside of the governmental or the banks or anything. We do not have birth control. In order to have birth control, you need the rabbi to authorize it. And he will only give that authorization in very rare occasions where the woman is very physically or mentally sick. Otherwise, the rabbi would say, eh, we should keep going. My sister told me a few days ago, she wanted to go into labor earlier, and according to her rabbi, it's not allowed. And her rabbi asked her, she was in terrible pain the whole pregnancy, and she asked if she's allowed to take something natural to speed up her birth. And the rabbi was like, eh, where are you rushing to? When is your, when is your due date? And she said, well, at least today, eh, you should wait a bit. Is she standing? This is my family, by the way. My parents, I'm not in this picture. My parents are quite young. My father was born in 1960. My mother was born in 1966. Do the math. This is their family when only part of the children are married. There are still four children that are not married yet. And this is already the children and the grandchildren. My mother is the oldest of 18 kids. My grandmother is, the old, is in the family of eight kids. My great-grandmother is 96 years old. She is still alive. And she has over a thousand children, grandchildren, great-children, great-grandchildren. <laughs> we have a phone book this thick, just for our family. I could meet my first cousin in the street and never know who they are. Communities are very poor. The people, their average income is much lower. I, for instance, lived in a 45 square meter apartment in B'nai B'rak with a wife and three kids. Our income was never more than probably seven or eight thousand shekels. That is like two thousand euros, something like that. How does the community work? How do they sustain themselves financially? These are charity boxes. If you ever go to B'nai B'rak or into the religious parts of Jerusalem, 
you will see these spread out all over the place. People in time of need will throw in some money in this. People, when they're looking for an object that was lost in the house or anything, they could say, I will donate 100 shekels to whatever staka, so I should find it. There is a whole banking system within the community where people who marry of children, they don't make enough money themselves, but they have to marry of their children, and they have to have money for it, because the children are not paying for their wedding. So they have the gemachim system. The gemach system works only on recommendation. You could put down $100,000 in B'nai Brak and get a very small piece of paper that somebody could pick up in Borough Park in Brooklyn without it going through any system whatsoever. And you get loans within the community also. And of course, Halakha does not permit the Gemach to gain anything from it. So if you take a loan, you will, you will give back the same exact loan as you got. Everything within the community is much cheaper. The supermarkets in the religious areas are cheaper. They buy more, they have more people buying, they could lower the price. They would import clothing and shoes before the holidays, so people could buy things for very cheap. Big families, holidays coming, you have to buy everyone new shoes, and nobody is making enough money to pay for it. The topic of this Yom Iyun is about walls. How do you create a wall around a society within the Western society? How do you control the people to stay inside? So of course, if you're not connected to the radio or to the television or to the newspapers, you're isolated. But it goes one step further. Kosher phone. What is a kosher phone? Um, no internet access. No internet? Uh, no, just phone and SMS. No SMS? No SMS. No, SMS. no, SMS. no camera? I have no. Kosher phone. You have a kosher phone? I have a kosher phone with internet, uh, no internet, SMS, and, uh, and email. WhatsApp. And email. We're going to come back to that in a second. Yes, mine is kosher. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good for orthodox. I will come back to that as well. <laughs> the traditional kosher phone, how it started off in Israel and in the United States, has no internet, no text messages, no camera, no MP3 player, just a phone, maybe a calculator, and an alarm clock. With time, the rabbi saw that there's a problem. This started with the internet. In Israel, when the internet came out, the rabbi said right away, no internet whatsoever. The rabbis in America had to be a bit more pragmatic. The people in America work more than the people in Israel. They have businesses. And the rabbis there held themselves back from banning the internet until they came up with JNet. JNet is the Jewish net, the Jewish kosher internet. Once it was established there, they also had um, kosher internet in Israel. One of my jobs in Israel was also the uh, head of marketing for one of these kosher internet companies. So kosher internet has, mainly speaking, two kind of categories. The more religious people will use something that's called a whitelist. Whitelist, everything is blocked. Only the things that are authorized, that were checked, will be opened. And that you will have the banks, you will have uh, transportation, um, basic hotels, uh, uh, websites in order to book hotels. You have that also, I'm guessing? No, I'm asking. You have kosher internet here in? I have not kosher internet, but email. And where, where do you live, may I ask? 
Oh, the street in Laval. Here, yes. in Zurich. Yes. And the phone itself is kosher or the internet provider is kosher? My phone is kosher, but I'm, there's an organization here mm -hmm. <coughs> which you take your phone to and they provide you all things you need for your phone. And uh, through that you are, I don't have internet. I don't need internet. Right. If somebody needs internet for certain things, they can be provided with any internet service for you. Well, not anything. Some things will be banned, and it also depends on who the body that is giving the authorization to this kosher. So within that, like we have different levels of kosher food, within that there will be different levels of who is giving, who is saying this phone is kosher, and who will accept it. So if you have a smartphone with WhatsApp, many schools you cannot send your children to in Israel and the United States, even if it's kosher. So within that, there's also levels. Which is wonderful. Yes, well, if, if that's the life you choose, of course. It's a very complicated system. Well, it's complicated from the outside. Uh -huh. When you see from the inside, it's less complicated. <laughs> this is a picture of the traditional highest level of kosher phone that exists that has nothing in it. How do they know if you have a kosher phone or not? How does the community know? When you enroll your children to the school, they ask you what your phone number is. The kosher numbers, the first three digits are different. If you don't have the right number, your child will not be accepted to the school. No. Yes. Well, like I said in the beginning, um, ultra-Orthodox life outside of Brooklyn or America and Israel, maybe Antwerp, is very, very different than within these communities. They live a much more isolated life. Do you have children? Yes, I've got nine children. Okay. I am positive that your children have way more knowledge about what's going on in the world than any of the people living in Bnei Brak, Yerushalayim, Munsi, Bora Park, or any of these places. I'm positive. Um, and I will even go out and leap and say that most people within the communities in Bnei Brak and in Mea Sharim will not accept you as ultra-Orthodox or Haredi. In their eyes, you're not enough for them. <laughs> I said I will go out and leap and say that. I believe not so. <laughs> My children live in Israel, and they live in a very orthodox world there. And I feel we are all accepted there, also, the way of life we live. Yes. Do they live in Meir Sharim? Well, I Okay, but we're following your very interesting yes. presentation. <laughs> Just keep on going. <laughs> the children are used as a bargaining chip, as a, a way to quite small now, it's bigger. A few years back, I wrote in an article criticizing a specific rabbi in Israel. The story that happened there was like this. A woman came to the rabbi and said, they suggested a man to her, this family, this family has genetic diseases. Two of his brothers have died already. She's afraid to marry this man, so he shouldn't die. The rabbi said, no, I promise you, you will grow old with him. They got married, had a few kids. One of those kids studied with my son in the same class. And at the age of 30, of course, he died. And I wrote something criticizing how does somebody take responsibility on himself to say somebody will live without the knowledge and without the power of doing so? Problem was, my son went to his school. I did not write his name, but they knew who I'm talking about. And shortly enough, a few months later, my son was expelled from the school, and I was sent a letter that my son does not suit this school anymore. Something else 
that is often used within the community is called Pashkevilim. Pashkevilim could be either on the billboard, you have printed papers shaming someone for doing something. If anyone steps out of line, the community will make sure that everyone knows that. These will be written in a very inner language way. Many biblical verses, many Talmudical uh, passages. It will be hinting to what has been done, or what the people writing it are not satisfied with. Someone from the outside could miss the whole thing that's going on here. But internally, this is a very, very strong, powerful way to keep people in mind. This specific picture is actually a fight between two groups within the Litvisha world, where here one group is tearing down the ads of the other group because they disagree with them. To get into that, we would have to have another hour and a half, so we're just going to continue. I'm sure many of you have heard the name Nitori Karta. How many people belong to Nitori Karta? Anybody want to guess? Do you feel? 5,000. 5,000? Less than 100 worldwide. Nitori Karta is a very, very, very small group of people that make a lot of noise. I know them personally. My cousin is the head of the group in Israel. Really? What's his name? Hirsch. Oh. Oh. <laughs> what about David Weiss? David Weiss is also from. He's also, he's in America. Yeah. They supposedly belong to the Satma sect. They take the original idea from Satma being against the state of Israel. They took it a few steps further. The one who came up with the idea of banning Israel as a state was Rabbi Yoel Teitelbaum. While he was alive, this group already evolved from inside his circles, and he threw them out. He said, this is too extreme, we're not going with the Arabs. We are only against the state of Israel for religious reasons, but we cannot go hand in hand with the enemy of the state. But the Satmar sect is against the state of Israel. The ones living in Israel do not participate in the elections there. They do not take money from the government for their schools. The ones that are able to do not even take child support from the, from the state. They do not visit the Western Wall. They usually do not go over the 67 borderline. Very funny story happened with my father when he was visiting Israel a while back. And my brother really wanted to go to the Kotel. So my father was going with him close around, you know, looking for a place where they could pray that's not inside the Kotel. And he decided that going through the metal detector, that is what counts as going to the Western Wall. So they found some place in the side there where you go down a few steps that's quite close to the Kotel and they prayed there. And they sent me pictures of that. I told my father, that's very nice. You just prayed at the Reform Kotel. <laughs> <laughs> I will explain. In Israel, there's dispute about whether or not there could be mixed praying near the Western Wall. The women of the wall make a very large prayer once a month, where they try to have it together. The one who controls the Western Wall nowadays is Rabbi Rabinowitz, and he's ultra orthodox. So, as a compromise, the government promised to have a third section in the Western Wall, which will be mixed. 
That third section is not built yet. What is built is a porch that you could go down through, through steps right before the metal detector. And that's where many reform and conservative people have their bat mitzvah. And your father is there. And my father as well. <laughs> <laughs> this is an actual picture, not photoshopped whatsoever, made by a very dear friend and photographer, Frederick Brenner. We worked on this project for about a year. What are the difficulties for someone that leaves? Someone that chooses to leave. So for me personally, I did not leave the community until I prepared myself emotionally that my children, my parents, my friends, and my family will never talk to me again. Because that is what happens in many cases. Once you leave, you're out. In addition to that, you have to be prepared to go into the open world without any knowledge, if you're Israeli, without knowing a word of English, without having a high school diploma, without having a profession that's worth anything in the open world, without knowing how to talk to people, without filling out a CV. I've worked in Israel over 40 jobs. I never filled out a CV in my life before that. Everything was within the community. And the jobs that I, have, that I had, were some of them were very professional. I installed air conditioners. I worked as a journalist. I worked in a high-tech company. Just things that usually require knowledge to do. But within the community, everything can be done. Once you know it, you can just do it. Even just basic things, how to open a bank account, how to pay bills, how to dress, how to go shopping, what fits with what. These are basic things that normal people grow up with in the Western world. If you grow up in a world that's black and white, that knowledge does not exist. Especially if you want to do that alone, without having a family, or friends, or anyone to support you. In my personal case, um, I was very positively surprised by my family, and my friends. I have a very good connection with my parents. My mother has visited me a few times, once even in the liberal community in Basel, in Mikvan, where the community got to see her. She gave us shiur there, Shabbat afternoon. Mm -hmm. And I'm still in contact with most of my friends. There is a big part of my family that does not talk to me. But like we said before, our families are big enough, we could spare a few not to talk to them. <laughs> My children live in Bnei Brak. I see them every month or two when I fly there. I, we Skype all the time, and we have a very good connection as well. I'm the worst. Yes. Yes. So uh, your way was lucky, but in the last time, uh, there were several uh, suicides in Israel from very orthodox people, young people who so no way and uh, committed suicide. Mm. One of the biggest problems within the community of people that are leaving, which are nowadays already a community, one of the biggest problems is a very high rate of suicide. People leaving have to go through a very, very difficult life. I was lucky to come to Germany where I could study and work and live a life. But people living within the communities have it very hard, especially the ones living in Israel and the United States. And therefore, I decided to open up an organization in Germany for people that want to leave the ultra-Orthodox communities, where they can find themselves in Germany to study and to work and to be part of a community 
without having to kill themselves. Um, this is actually a, a, a sentence that I heard from one of my professors in Potsdam. He said to me that he heard from other people who left. One does not leave the ultra-Orthodox world, the Haredi world, only when the alternative is to kill themselves. And when somebody's on that level, uh, according to studies, the suicide rate, or the wanting to, do su wanting to suicide rate within the community of people who leave is, who live, who leave, is the same high, the same rate as transgender. People who are thrown out of their previous world, people who can't find themselves in the new world, and have enormous identity problems and belonging to something. And of course, to that comes in many times having to break of contact with their family, with their children and siblings and all that. Are you aware that uh, I have seen stickers here in Zurich of an organization with a hotline also for people just uh, you mentioned? So if there is a chance to connect or already, indeed already... I'm meeting with him in an hour. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because really? I think they or we as Jews, whoever we are, uh, we need those networks helping people in distress. I agree. I think that people who succeeded to make this transaction have the moral obligation to help those who haven't yet. I myself think of myself as lucky that I did, so I try to do whatever I can to help other people. There is uh, one thing I don't understand about the differences between the different uh, Hasidic groups, because we have uh, many Hasidic uh, people in our family, we have all kinds of people in our family, and I have, uh, for instance, one cousin living in Borough Park, and he is an art dealer. And uh, he, uh, when we are together, we don't have so many differences. He can go, ev not everywhere, but uh, uh, they don't live. It's many things I don't understand. Why is it so separate? And in the meantime, not so. They are not so separate. So, of course, that would depend on which Hasidic group he's from. He is uh, Bobov. So, Bobov is a more open group. Yes. Um, if you would compare it, for instance, to Square, which is a new square, they have their own village, and not far from Mansi. They would be Nasha much. Lustig is from Square. Nasha Lustig, for instance, yeah, very dear friend, he's from Square. Mm -hmm. Lieber Schmelzel is from Square. Yes, Lieber So Baba would be um, a more open Hasidic sect, mm -hmm. and within each of those, of course, there are people that are more outgoing and more modern. And they are all uh, working. His, right. uh, his boys, uh, his sons are working. They went to yeshivas for a certain time, and then they came back and have, uh, well, it's not so different. At some, at some point, everybody will go to work. Mm -hmm. The question is just how much they will make and what profession they will work. Mm -hmm. Because if you start to look for a profession when you're 30 and you don't have a uh, high school diploma, your options are quite limited. You can't become a lawyer by that point. Some do. In Israel, some do. Some ultra-Orthodox have night school where they go to become lawyers. Mm -hmm. um, the colleges lower their standards for the ultra-Orthodox, mm -hmm. which makes them have a hard time finding jobs sometimes afterwards, but they can become lawyers. There, there is such an option. Yes. But the options are much less. Like, there are no ultra-Orthodox Hasidic doctors. There is one that I know of, but like, generally speaking, that doesn't exist because you don't have the seven, ten years to study yes. when you have a family and kids when you're 20. So where's all the funding coming from then? Which funding? Well, to maintain all these uh, communities. Well, some of the money comes from wealthy people. Some of the money comes from the government. Um, I know, for instance, uh, the joint pays for a lot, a lot of uh, activities within the community, even though the joint is a relatively secular organization. Um, and of course, there are many wealthy people within the community. Some people that did succeed somehow. 
either through real estate or they inherited something or they made something out of themselves and there are rich people within the community that could support. In the bottom line, everybody will work and everybody will somehow support themselves. The question is just about standards. I've heard that the actual Israeli government or better the administration is very aware that they have two groups that do not participate enough economically to the... Arabs and Saudi Right. Uh, you continue what you, <laughs> what you want to have. It's a problem. They know that. And is there more activity to put uh, Haredim into the working force? They try to do that. Um, it sometimes could be a bit difficult when you're sitting in the government and a few of the ministers are Haredim. It complicates things a bit. Um, can you talk about intermarriage? Hmm. Intermarriage within the Haredi community? Yes. yes. I mean, to what extent is there, is there crossover between the different states or is it really absolutely, absolutely sex, sex? So That's a very good question. Um, it's allowed to a certain extent. Um, some will prefer to marry within their community. When they get too old and they're out of options, then they'll look elsewhere. Um, other, other Hasidic groups will have problems. For instance, the Gul uh, sect, the Gul Hasidut in Yerushalayim, many do not want to marry their men because they have very strict sexual restrictions even after marriage, which I'm not going to get into because it's so long. They have a big group of older men that can find who to marry. So it depends on which group. But generally speaking, there is intermarriage within the Hasidic groups and within the Litvish groups. These two usually would not marry with, him, with each other unless people are too old and there's no other option. Too old and 30? No, 24. <laughs> <laughs> My mother actually founded a group in Muncie that supports parents of people who left. Mm. Mm. And I had the privilege to talk to this group once. I was invited there to talk to the mothers of children who left. And for them, I was their child that they could ask questions to because their children, they feel like they can ask those questions to. And she is very active in keeping the warm connection between parents and children. How was I so lucky? <laughs> Before I'm going to come to you back, I'm just going to finish up here. Who are the celebrities within the Haredi world? The Rebbes. The Rabbis. The Rabbis. He said the Rebbes. Oh, you're Litvish. <laughs> so, to answer your question about intermarriage, these two would not marry, usually speaking. <laughs> usually speaking. The rabbis are the celebrities. Everything goes through them. I worked in a hospital as a technician in an operation room. Also, without having any prior knowledge, just as I said before. <laughs> Urgent operations were stalled off because the family had to have the rabbi's authorization to proceed. They could have all the doctors saying that it has to be done. Until the rabbi says yes, it will not get done. This was in B'nai B'ak. Growing up in many houses, Kids gather baseball cards or whatever is common to, to collect nowadays. We collect cards, pictures of rabbis. Okay. We know all their names, 
for the families, which dynasty they're from, how many people belong to that group, where they are. And these are actually weekly magazines that come out with pictures of them doing activities, just day-to-day -day activities. This could be um, a wedding, this could be Tu um, Bishvat. The people who are looked up to within the community are the rabbis, and they have absolute control of everything. Going back to the <coughs> clip we saw before. from the Lelov dynasty. He's a very special person in my opinion. Um, he has many followers. He doesn't have an official Hasidic sect, but he has uh, many followers that look up to him. You had a question before. Yes, uh, because you said the rabbis would expel your child from school. So what alternatives would you have had for the, for the schooling for the child if it really had happened? It had happened. Uh -huh. My son was expelled. Uh -huh. I had to send him to a more modern school uh -huh. where they would accept him. Even though his father wrote something on the internet that criticized the rabbi. Uh -huh. But then and when you were leaving the Sattva, would then your children also be expelled from the school? school? No? When you left the Sattva? If children would be expelled if the father left, yes. that depends. Usually not, because the community would try to protect the children from the father that left. Mm -hmm. So they would keep the children away from the father. Mm -hmm. What about if the mother left? Yeah. Then the children would probably be expelled, mm -hmm. because the children would... Follow the mother? Yes. Mm -hmm. You said that your mother is helping these other mother mothers? I see more mothers than fathers. You didn't say that. I only saw mothers there. No. Okay. It's a group for women by women. Of how, for, of how many people having left are we talking? So in Israel, the numbers are about between ten and fifteen percent of every year of the school. Ten to fifteen. Ten to fifteen percent every year of every school year. Oh. We're talking about thousands of people. That way, that are leaving. That are leaving. So attrition. That's the word. Attrition. Attrition. It's a very, it's a, it's a very large group of thousands of people that live here. Yeah. What about the girls? How many girls would you own percentage? percentage? Approximately 80-20. Girls leave much less. Why, why do girls leave less the community? Um, that is another reason. Because if the woman left and the man stayed, in most cases, she would lose the children. That is true. Another fundamental reason why women leave less is the way we're brought up. The women in the schools are brought up to obey the husband, 
Not to think, just to obey. The system doesn't teach women any kind of text that require too much thinking. And the ideal woman is a woman who obeys her husband. In a broader sense, obeys the system. Women have less access to knowledge, to research things, and therefore, in my opinion, women leave much less. In a, in a, in a altogether total, it's approximately 20-80% uh, for the men. 80% of, of the people who leave are men and only about 20% are women. How is the woman, the married woman, looked at when the husband leaves? And who cares for her then? Well, married men have to pay child, um, divorced men have to pay child support regardless if they left or not. Um, it will depend on which community they're in, who will look after them. Usually the family will take them in, not like physically, they will stay in their house, but the family will look after them, have them part of the family. Um, and financially, they would continue the same way any other divorced couple would continue. Sorry, do the men leave when, leave when they are still young or when they were married already or what's the...? I do not have the statistics about that. Um, the ones I know will leave between the age of 20... 2 to 28, that would be like the time frame of that. When they're married. When they're married. Mm -hmm. You had a question also? <coughs> I was in a, a training at the Trauma Center in Shulai, and we had women from Beit Shemesh. Um, and uh, the topic was with, uh, working with the abused children. Sexual abuse? Sexual abuse, which doesn't exist, I know. But, um, what? Uh, Does that exist? <laughs> the the I heard from this, I worked with this woman, and it was a nightmare. A nightmare. They were not allowed to treat those uh, people the way they should have been treated because they were by just interfering because it doesn't exist. Can you tell a bit? That is a very, very painful. Um, situation and a very painful um, subject within the community. What happens when there is sexual abuse within the community? Every place has sexual abuse. Within the ultra-Orthodox world, according to the statistics of the city of Jerusalem, the rate is much higher. Why is that? It's a combination, again in my opinion, of a few things. Children are raised not to question elders. If the teacher in the school decides to do something with the children sexually, the children are taught to think that it's okay, that they know what they're doing. In my eight years of school, the school threw out two teachers that were sexually molesting kids. The kids told that? One of them was my cousin. But the kids told it... Uh, well, it came out uh, somehow. somehow. People started saying bits and pieces until the, the system found out. Now, what do you think happened to these two teachers? Exactly. They were sent to a different city where they started teaching in a different school. Because the rabbis didn't want this problem in their city, so they were sent elsewhere. None of it was ever reported to the police, none of it was ever reported to anyone, and they were never treated. Sounds very Catholic. Sounds very Catholic, it is. One of them, one of them is a cousin of mine, which has, in addition to molesting who knows how many kids throughout the years as a teacher, many, many, many family members were molested by him. And I know this story personally. They're my cousins. I know them. <coughs> and he was never treated.
That is one side of the coin why these children are such easy prey. The other side of it is also the lack of knowledge. Officially, we learn about sex when we get married. It used to be a day before marriage or the day of the wedding. Nowadays, I was told about sex three days before my wedding. I did some research myself before, but <laughs> the official system taught me the, the three days before my wedding. So if you have boys studying, studying in school, which have no, no sexual knowledge whatsoever, they don't even know what he's doing, it's much easier to take abuse of them, to abuse them. Aren't there families leaving? Like, let's say a couple really gets along well and finds that's not our way. And what do they do then? So the problem is like this. It happens, first of all. Some couples leave. Some couples leave with their children. I have more than one friend that left with their whole family. Mm -hmm. The problem is that... Let's say, in a, in, a, in a normal situation, where the man is the one that's starting to have doubts in the system. He doesn't have who to talk to. He has to hide his um, beliefs, or non-beliefs, his disbeliefs. He has to hide his disbeliefs. And he can't share with anyone, either, neither in the community nor in, the, in his family. <coughs> So nowadays, there are Facebook groups or some hidden uh, um, online forums where they could consult with other people. But his wife will usually not be part of the process. She will not know about it until he has decided that he wants to leave. What's his fear? If he tells her before, then she will get all the rabbis against him mm -hmm. and the whole family against him and then he will be isolated right away. Thank you very much.